please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Hello and welcome to the June 12 Planning Commission meeting for Half Moon Bay. Uh, can I please get the roll call? Yes. Uh, we'll start with <coughs> Commissioner Devon. Here. Chair Hernandez. I am present. Uh, Vice Chair Holt. Here. And would like to note that uh, Commissioners Benjamin and Evans would not be able to make it this evening. So noted. Thank you. Um, the next item on the agenda is the approval of minutes. Uh, do we have any feedback on the, actually, do we have quorum for? Okay, so we will, uh, wait, yeah, we do. Hey. Do you guys have any comments on the uh, minutes from May 22nd? I move we approve. Uh, May 22nd, 2018, Planning Commission minutes. Second. Okay, we have a second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. So passed. Okay, so this part of the Planning Commission meeting is where we have public comment. For those of you who have an item that is uh, not on the agenda, uh, we would invite you to come forward and speak on it. I have a number of comment cards here. Uh, I'd like to go ahead and start with uh, Courtney Pazin, followed by Christina Conklin. So, wow. uh, and while you figure out how to get the green light working on your microphone, I will. Uh, you need to press the button until it's solid. Got green. it. Excellent. And because the item's not on the agenda, the great mystery of public meetings in California is that we cannot comment on your comments in particular. If you raise a particular question, we can ask staff to investigate it or follow up, but we're not allowed to respond to your comments. And I know many of you um, looking at the comments here uh, it's a theme that's been continued for the last few meetings, so I just, just wanted to share that with everybody, so please. I appreciate that. I've never done this before. <laughs> Can you hear me? I'm having a little trouble, so... Hello? There okay. we go. Okay. Wow. Okay. Hi. Um, I've never spoken at a public meeting before, but I live in El Granada, and I've lived on the coast since I was probably about 10, um, and this whole... Um, an informal um, application and proposal for the Dunes, um, the Dunes um, Resort and RV Park is very concerning. I know it, um, it is to a lot of locals, but I was just doing some research, um, and I know I can't ask questions, but I'll just put it out there. I noticed that the water rights for some of the land was already sold to um, the realtor and the developer back in March, I think, um, of 2017. And um, I don't know what that means, but I just have a hard time understanding why a local family would be selling all of these water rights to somebody for agricultural land, which, you know, it states um, in the local coastal program land use plan that the land designated north and south of Young Avenue is to be for single story resident dwelling. Um, so I'm not sure how this. I mean, I know it's not a form application yet, but it sounds like the developer has been trying to, you know, do this for quite some time. I don't think he's going to stop. He, he lives on $11.6 million property up in Los Altos. Um, and his realtor, Steve Weed, um, you know, owns a lot around, around this parts. So he owns a lot of the water rights to some of the parcels over there. Um, so I'm just really concerned because Dunes is awesome. Um, we love to surf there. We love to go there on the weekends. We don't want to overrun with more tourism. 200 rooms in a hotel, no matter how eco-friendly it is. I've worked in hotels for a large portion of my life, and that is the, 
that's a lot of resources, a lot of garbage, a lot of careless people coming and going. And um, yeah, it just kind of sucks because land, if anything, if it needs to be developed, should be for locals, teachers, seniors, low-income housing, you know, things that aren't gonna upset all of us. And the land, I mean, the Ritz-Carlton is huge and that's only on like 14 acres. They're talking about a 41-acre project and that's, that's pretty significant, I mean. Um, so yeah, I just, I just don't understand why, like, can anyone just submit a formal application even though, like, they know it's not gonna fly, like, or is this actually a project that's, you know, underway in some way that nobody knows about? So, those are my concerns and I really hope this doesn't happen and interested in hanging out with anybody who also feels the same way. Thanks. Thank you for your comments. Um, just a point of order, um, we've heard similar concerns from a process perspective. What is the process? Perhaps at the next planning commission meeting, if we could get a short summary of what the process is so the public can be more informed about next steps, participation points, and so forth, I think that would be really helpful. Uh, Christina Conklin, followed by Amber Stowe. Hi. Um, yeah, I, that was actually going to be one of my uh, questions. Was was a process question. Um, so I appreciate the points that the former speaker made. And I um, I went out to the site and did a, a walking tour, um, having looked at the city's really extensive, excellent uh, report on the Poplar Beach Bluffs area, which looks at erosion and impacts on that site to the coastal trail that are going to be happening um, over the coming years and what. Uh, changes to um, to mitigate the erosion and uh, you know what very sophisticated thinking and a good report on that site and I'm um, going to ask uh, the Planning Commission to ask the city to extend that study to the northern part of the coastal trail because it's a resource that um, the neighborhoods in the north part of town uh, use very heavily and extensively and what I found is that there's a there's about 85 feet between the path along Dunes Beach, the Dunes Beach parking lot, and the, the bluffs. And in some places, it's only 30 feet. And the erosion has two or three significant gullies and some smaller ones. And these, is, these are exactly the things that were um, noted in the, uh, the impact report um, for the Poplar Beach area. And I think a similar analysis of the Dunes Beach area would really be valuable because if, if um, the on Poplar Beach, you, if you, you, you have space to move the path back. At Dunes Beach, there's a little bit of space to move the path back. And then if there's something built there, you have a hard stop. And um, people would, that, it would last for a little while, there would be a coastal trail there, and then it would be gone. And um, I think this is an amenity we all count on as co-siders. So that is something I would uh, like the um, city to do. And um, I would also, I have a couple of specific requests, and one is that the, uh, I understand that the, the proposal for this project was submitted recently, I, I don't know. Okay, Jill's shaking her head. Okay, uh, when it's submitted, can it be posted on the city's website in a prominent location so that we can find it easily? I've had a very hard time finding the developer's website, but I, fi I finally did. Um, I think sunshine um, is, is good for in governance and so that the city, uh, our, you know, residents can understand what this proposal is would be very important. Um, and, and hopefully also a link to the, uh, the developer's website because apparently it has, it has even more of the vision. Um, and also I'm wondering if, if it's possible for the city to put up um, past traffic studies that on Highway 1, I, I know they've been done by various parts of the government over time, the school district and the city and probably the county, and I think for uh, local residents to understand the traffic impacts would be really important. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Amber Stowe, followed by Mike Palom. Uh, thank you. I'm actually going to be rereading comments that I made at the May 8th meeting where quorum was not reached um, in part due to traffic congestion in Half Moon Bay. Uh, the dunes 
proposal comes hot on the heels of the Hyatt development. And we have yet to see the impacts of other recent developments in our area, specifically the Best Western on Wavecrest and the Pacific Ridge Tract. In just the seven years I have lived here, traffic in Half Moon Bay has increased from a nuisance on event days like Pumpkin Festival and Dream Machines to snarls and backups every weekend between April and October. It is a level of traffic that can turn a quick drive to the grocery store into a half hour ordeal and will make conditions untenable for residents and visitors alike if we add another four to 500 cars per day on our roads. That's assuming one car per unit of the hotel and RV park. And that's not adding the new patrons of the Best Western staying right across the street from another 150 patrons at a proposed Hyatt. Half, Moon's Bay, Half Moon Bay's geography is uniquely unforgiving. We hug the coastline. We effectively have only two roads in and out of town. This would be the second oversized hotel proposed on Highway 1 in less than three months. I grew up in Southern California. I watched our local planning commission rubber stamp development after development until the semi-rural town I grew up in became an overcrowded suburb. But my hometown had a pre-existing six-lane highway running by it. And we don't have that luxury here. What do you suppose this hotel will do to that stretch and beyond of Cabrillo Highway? Every day at rush hour, traffic got, grinds to a halt around straw flower, and the backup extends in all directions on, and on weekends spills over to the neighborhoods and into downtown. What is this commission's plan for the extra 500 cars per day going through that same choke point? Is the plan to endlessly widen the highway, or are we going to put in a block-by-block -block series of stoplights until Half Moon Bay more closely resembles Southern California beach communities like Santa Monica and Malibu, or Northern California communities like Carmel? Um, I'm just wondering what the end game is here. The positive impacts of this development, increased revenue and visibility, are far outweighed by the negative in form of increased traffic, increased strain on our infrastructure, and further overcrowding of our beaches. The Dunes proposal is too much development too soon and too fast, and neglects to take into account the impacts on our roads and residents. Increased traffic congestion is a major concern for San Mateo County voters and the Bay Area at large. How is adding a hotel and convention center going to improve that? Thank you for your comments. Mike Palome, uh, first, followed th by Mike Ferrara. First, thank you for listening to our concerns. Uh, <clears throat> I just basically have two questions. Right now, there's the roughly 47 acres. All that rainwater go is absorbed by the ground. If this project goes through, how does this developer plan the dispose of the storm drain. Where's this water going to go? And second, if you've got all these uh, 183, I think that's the number, I'm not sure, of the RVs, and you've got the resort, you've got laundry, you've got showers, you've got the sewage, is that going to overload our sewage uh, disposal in addition to all the other projects you people have on the agenda? Thank you. Thank you for your succinct comments. Former Mayor Mike Farrar. Uh, good evening, Chair Hernandez and Commissioners. Uh, I, this project that's being proposed for Dune Beach is uh, wildly inconsistent with what we have in our LCP for that area. Not even close. So very obviously, it would have to require an amendment to our LCP. And I guess I'm really curious about at what point do the people get to decide whether they want to change their own LCP. I, I think that if that question were put to the people, you'd get a resounding no. I do not know where the law is relative to the council or the planning commission as to what their ability to say no is. But I think you can certainly take it from the speakers that come here, from what's on the local blogs, et cetera, et cetera. There's not many fans for this thing here or in the mid-coast. And frankly, the sooner we get this golem off our backs, the better. 
And uh, so I'm just advocating that we take some steps to put an end to this. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Roy Salumi? Hopefully I got your name right, Roy. Yeah, it's, it's been mangled many times before. Um, I hope the commission and uh, the public in general will join me in extending uh, sympathy to uh, Commissioner Benjamin and his family on the passing of his mother. And uh, he's absent because he's attending to family matters, so I'm, I'm sure you will do that. Thank you. Thank you for your comments regarding Commissioner Benjamin. Um, we share your sentiment. Those of you who have any other public comments, if you haven't filled out a green card, this is your opportunity. Not seeing anybody rushing to the podium, I will go ahead and close public comment. And we will move to, a yes please. Just while we still have all these folks in the room, I, I would like to just, because we're staff and we can respond a little bit to um, what we heard tonight. Um, First of all, Ms. Conklin, I know you left me a message today and I didn't get back to you because it's Planning Commission Day and I struggle, so I apologize and I'm, I'm happy to talk to you later this week. Um, we do intend to post the application on the website. We don't have one yet. We had a preliminary submittal, so again, I just want to note that and that's why we're not spending a lot of staff time um, doing things like that at this point. However, one thing we did do is on the city's website, um, hmbcity.org, there's a place where you can sign up to be on different email lists. And we did uh, set up an email list for both the Hyatt proposal as well as the um, potentially pending Surf Dunes pr proposal. So if you haven't already done that, that's something you can do. And um, we will be using, uh, we, we really like to have these lists. They're really helpful for us. The other thing that we do is when we have um, key milestones in projects, um, we put them out in our e-news and our public information officer also posts the information on Nextdoor because our experience with uh, your community is that you use that a lot. So if there's any other tools like that um, that you want to let me know about later on um, over the next week or so, please do. And that was, that was just a couple things I, I thought I could pop in the record while you're here. Thank you. Yes, one second. So thank you, Jill. And um, I would like to encourage everybody to sign up for the email the city website. It has uh, been a great source of transparency and activities. And I'd like to commend city staff for their work in doing what they can to make things as apparent to the public. Commissioner. Thank you very much. Jill, <clears throat> just curious, do you have any sense of a general timeline on when a full application might be submitted? I, ex I, I expected this month, but um, there was a, a date that we were, um, that has passed when, when I thought it was going to land on the counter. So, uh, I don't have a new date. I'll let you know if there's a target date that, that I can share, but I would expect it within the next few weeks. Thank you. So we will reclose public comment. And uh, no, ma'am, you may speak. Please go okay. ahead and All right. so make, I, sure the, make sure the microphone's turned on. I haven't finished it yet. No. Please. OK, there we go. So, um, yes, I've spoken before. Rosalyn Ramsey, and I live in Miramar. And I worked on the Slow Gro Growth Initiative way back when, I don't know, in the 80s. What, which, which proposition was that? Um, yes. And so um, sometimes I wonder, I mean, so I've lived here for over 40 years, and this place is still pretty cool. It's, it hasn't uh, grown too fast, and it's a beautiful place for the visitors to come to and for the people who live here. And we want to attract people. Isn't that what everybody wants to do is attract visitors to come? But why would we fill up the corridor with hotel after hotel 
when that's not going to serve the visitors and it's not going to serve us. Half Moon Bay is very, very unique. It's a very, very unique. People come from all over the world to live here. Visitors come from all over the world to live, to visit here. Now you might say, okay, well, we need more places for those visitors to stay. Do, do we really need more places for those visitors to stay? With things like Airbnb, where local residents can make money, and because it's spread out over the whole community, and the community is the one that ends up benefiting, why not encourage that kind of slow growth as far as visitors come, rather than these big, what do we call it, uh, a big thing, okay? So um, I also remember quite a while back another person or another entity wanting to build in that area, and, and they didn't get to do it. So what makes it okay for them to build now? If everybody, if it got shut down many years ago, I think it was, what, 10 or 15 years ago? Does anybody remember that? So um, that area is beautiful. That area is a very beautiful, picturesque. You can see the ocean from the highway driving down there. And I just want to say that instead of... Um, I don't know what our motivation is. Is it tax dollars? Is that what we're trying to do? Is we're trying to get more tax dollars for Half Moon Bay? I, I'm not sure um, what, why we would want, why would we want this? Why would you guys want to allow this to happen in our town? Maybe you guys will answer that later. Um, anyway, I just want to put my two cents in that um, I lived here before there were any stoplights on Highway 1 between Princeton and Half Moon Bay. There was none. There was a blinking light at, I think, Surfer's Beach, and there was a blinking light at, at Princeton where uh, the harbor is. And now there's stoplights, and that's okay. That has to happen. But I do get concerned about the, the gridlock that's going to happen here. I mean, it's already kind of happening. Anyway, thank you very much for my, your time, my time, your time. Thank you for your comments, and uh, I think you've hit upon many of the thorny issues that we have to deal with as your planning commission. So with that, I'm going to close public comment, and we're going to move on to planning commission business, third attempt to do so. <laughs> um, so uh, the first item we have is the capital improvement fis for fiscal year 2018-2019, and John? Would you like to introduce yourself to the public and take it away for us, please? Sure, thanks. John Dowdy, I'm your public works director for the city of Half Moon Bay. Pleased to be here. It's been a little while since I've been at the Planning Commission, so um, I hope you've uh, appreciated what we left you in good hands, I think, with Jill, but it's nice to be here. Um, click. I don't have a clicker, so I have the weird clicker. So uh, there are a lot of slides, and Jill's going to kill me. Um, but I'll try to work through these pretty quickly and then come back to anything that you wish to, um, to hit upon. What I want to do is give you just a, a really quick overview of what the CIP is and then detail out the 2018-19 project list. So um, tonight, um, this is a role that the state legislature has set as the Planning Commission's role, which is to review the list of projects within um, the fiscal year to come and to determine that those projects are consistent with the general plan. Um, now we all recognize we're in the process of a general plan update, an LCLUP update, and so this um, clearly is a is somewhat a challenging time to be, to be trying to deal with the consistency issues. Um, but here we are and this is an obligation that we have to deal with. So basically the CIP is, is primarily um, sort of as a planning document as well as a financial document. And um, ultimately it's designed to allow the community city council to prioritize various projects, programs, and um, with the available funding uh, that they have. Thank you. So um, 
what we're looking at today are the projects that have been identified for the capital budget, which is year one of the capital improvement program. The capital improvement program is a five-year program, year one being the budgeted year, year two, three, and four, five being um, the uh, years that are looked at in terms of budgeting, but they are not absolute projects. Those will come back and whatever was listed in year two and also new projects identified will then become the new rolling first year or capital budget next year. So it's a constant um, readjusting up to a five-year plan. Um, generally, these are pretty, uh, fairly large in size in this community, large in size, high value. We've put it 30,000, so in other communities that might be a lot higher number, uh, but here we're looking at basically 30,000 as our threshold point that we look at. And these are all sort of uh, non-recurring and permanent in nature, so a one-time repair fix doesn't necessarily equate to, um, to a capital because it's not actually investing new and creating new capital. So um, this went before the city council as part of uh, two different uh, study sessions, including the May 1st uh, large study session and followed up on May 15th to the council. Um, and these were basically the directions that they um, gave to us in terms of looking at identifying what's going on. I think the two big issues there that I point out are to try to look at slightly less robust list of, of big projects. We've been um, unable to deliver on the projects because we've been way too, um, well, we've accepted and, 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 and identified way too many projects, more than what we can legitimately um, deliver on. Um, I'm concerned, once again, that we did exactly the same thing in 2018, 19, but, um, uh, there are so there continue to be so many needs and wants and great projects and also funding that we've been successful at obtaining um, at grants and such that it uh, it makes it difficult to to uh, narrow down the list sometimes. The other part of this was to integrate smaller projects, smaller improvement projects, particularly to parks and facilities, um, to be implemented through our maintenance division, and so that was um, some added. Um, basically maintenance uh, public works projects. Thank you. So um, the CIP is broken into various components of basically the functional areas and so um, this will just work through a series of these. I'm, I'm hoping not to spend a great deal of time going through each one of these but for the purposes of, of your review you can take a look at these and, and deal with it. Um, the drainage projects um, primarily um, roll from um, our storm drain master plan implementation, um, which then kind of equate down to identifying projects. So the Seymour Ditch erosion project was completed, the temporary repair this year, and now we're moving forward into, um, into the permanent repair. This is going to be a significant effort um, to get through the um, permitting processes to look at um, uh, areas to store the water, to not just push the water in through the ditch as fast and as quickly as we possibly can, which, um, which will increase and continue with the incising that's happening there and the deterioration. So we're looking um, upstream and that's a large um, project. Um, notably, I think the questions in terms of the implementation side is we're focusing next year on Highway 1 and Kelly Avenue, um, diverting um, stormwater that's coming down Highway 1 and now heading down Kelly Avenue and flooding the yards and front yards of a lot of houses down Kelly. And this would divert along Shoreline Station, along Highway 1 in, um, in open, um, in open um, areas and pipe to deal with also treatment of that water as well as slowing it down and working through. And then we've got um, a pretty um, issue with Pullman Court and Roosevelt Ditch and looking at trying to deal with existing wall that's there that's collapsing. There's also a manhole that's there for the sewer that's in being threatened and then looking at um, how do we deal with some of the localized flooding there. Um, this will require some pretty significant environmental review and effort there and whether this can be done in the coming year is a question. Um, we'll do what we can do and, and deal with that. Thank you. 
So from um, economic development, uh, general plan, um, near and, and LCLUP, near and dear to your hearts, um, where we will be working on the um, completing the electric vehicle charging stations. We'll add an additional one at City Hall. Uh, there'll be one at the library. The new library will have a new um, uh, EV charging station. And there'll be one um, at the Adcock Center as well. So there's three partially funded by grants um, that we uh, went after and dealt with. Um, but those are coming. And then we'll continue to work on uh, various wayfinding and entryway signs. Um, from an operational improvement side, we're going to be um, implementing, we've contracted now with the enterprise resource planning um, consultant contractor to develop the um, program and to review and to go through that process. That's going to be um, a couple of years in, in, in the making. That also is going to integrate in a land use component to that, meaning for permitting software for the public works permits encroachment permits all those things to be included and then we're also looking seriously at this year moving forward on the GIS implementation it's high time and with the LCLUP general plan update we and along with all our other utilities and work that we're dealing with it we have to deal with um, with integrating GIS um, more fully so uh, parks parks is a high priority um, with our with the council and I think within the community Jill and you and the Parks um, and Rec Commission um, have been working vigilantly on getting the Parks Master Plan um, moving forward. That's now in, in really good standing. We're working on now um, kicking off in, with the environmental work. And out of that will come a number of projects through the years. Um, this year, this coming year, we're looking at several things um, to try to jump ahead of some of the bigger uh, projects and those are the red um, items and those are some of the smaller projects and then you've got a series of sort of master planning efforts that will occur at uh, Carter Park uh, with the Smith Field, the Train Depot and Johnston House as well as um, this site here from 555 Kelly um, out and back to here to look at what do we, how do we um, better plan for this whole site and facility area. So that's coming soon. Um, so this just reflects the implementation on the parks um, master plan and moving forward and so that's, that's there. Um, from public facilities, um, a big effort that we're dealing with is that we are behind in our, I shouldn't say that that openly, but we are behind in completing and um, assessing our ADA um, conformant, conformance for all our public buildings, our public streets. Um, parks, um, parking lots, all of those things. So we um, actually had our kickoff meeting today with the, con with the consultant. There'll be um, a public outreach process as uh, associated with that. And then we'll be <laughs> developing and working through the transition plan. The big issue here is to integrate in um, various components of um, that transition plan into our planning for uh, street improvements, crosswalk improvements, um, facilities, all of those things, and to prioritize those projects along with uh, basically getting ATA, ADA um, compliance there. Thanks. Um, one of the um, things that we're also focused on, and this comes with both um, the risk management side as well as from ADA uh, perspective, um, accessibility is sidewalks. And um, we completed this last year a street tree survey looking at um, virtually all the street, the trees that are located within the rights of way, the streets and the rights of way of the city, as well as some other uh, grove areas that the city owns. Um, and so now that's being matched up with the sidewalk survey that was done the preceding year and um, matching up around uh, with that. Um, and then also working through with the various um, utilities that also have uh, um, boxes and vaults that are creating problems. So this is a significant issue. We're going to try to, I think, narrow down this list a bit to start with, get some project work done, get some sidewalks replaced and deal with it that are the, the most needed and deal with that. Um, we're going to be looking at trimming and pruning the Main Street trees. This continues to be 
um, a question that comes up from the businesses there. Um, this is something that's needed. This is about an every five year project and we're also gonna be working as a result of that um, tree survey um, on a uh, grid based pruning cycle. So we'll be moving with that, thanks. Um, sewer projects, uh, this is one of those odd things that when I first came to work here, um, it was unclear what we did in sewer or whether we even had a sewer system. Yes, we do. We have a sewer collection system. Uh, we have 35 miles of sewer, 37 miles of sewer collection system. Um, we do a lot of work in our um, sewer collection system. It's an expensive proposition. Um, most of you here in the, um, many of you at least here are within the city limits and, um, and, and pay your sewer bills, thank you. Um, and that's what pays for these improvements and things. Um, and so we're gonna be working on a variety of things um, out there. And um, one of the big projects is something we haven't yet taken up with the neighbors, but um, on Lauren Lane near Kehoe, there is, um, I think, eight or nine houses that have a sewer main that runs in the backyards, in their backyards, which are, have to be replaced. So this is gonna be a significant <laughs> undertaking um, just in um, the sheer pain and suffering that will be with landscaping that exists, walls, fences, and it's gonna have to be an open trench going in to remove this pipe. Um, so that's um, just something to, that we're looking forward to. <laughs> um, Ocean Colony is going to see uh, their entire pump station and force main replaced. It's um, time to replace those. Um, and then also we're looking at some other work for the other pump stations. So we operate three pump stations and force mains um, in the city as well in the collection system. And then uh, street projects. The great news is the council is scheduled next week to award the contract for um, a number of uh, street improvement projects, including Magnolia between Main Street and Highway 1, which has been, um, I know, desired. Uh, also part of Church Street and a variety of other places and pieces of, of property. Miramontes Point, finish up the area from the Kenyatta um, Mobile Home Park uh, back to Highway 1. So um, some good improvements there. What um, We're going to look at at how do we um, sort of work through additional improvements as part of the ADA kind of transition plan and dealing with those things and, um, and go from there. And then uh, this year we will finish up the pavement uh, projects and then look at what should be coming next. We anticipate working on um, a benefit assessment district for Belleville Boulevard. We're also gonna be working um, on a community outreach process and potential even benefit assessment district consideration for Poplar Street to leverage um, an a million plus dollar grant that we received to do a complete streets project from Main Street down to Railroad. So that's a very exciting project and we're gonna try to link that project with the Gateways, uh, Poplar Gateways project. We're looking at many of the same interests, um, same neighbors, same, um, same issues to some extent and the um, access and the area for Poplar Beach seem to make a lot of sense. So we're gonna try to tie those together as much as possible. Um, the trail projects, um, we're, we received a grant to, to do work from Marotta Road um, to the ultimate, uh, basically, extension of where the um, county is planning to finish up and extend the uh, trail, the, the class one trail on the east side of Highway 1. Um, so in the north part of, of the area, so that would connect in um, from, from um, the area there at Frenchman's and along there. Um, one of the uh, high priority items that was identified in the draft um, PED bike master plan um, was centered around that east side uh, pathway and trail. So this was a grant that, that we recently received and this will be the piece of it, um, looking at continuing the pieces and then the highway one North project will be a big piece of this. Um, the major piece that we don't have funding for is the bridge um, and the extension basically from, um, from Frenchman's Road um, over to Rousseau, Rousseau Francais and that bridge across there. So that's gonna be a major undertaking to deal with and to try to fund that, but we're working there. And then again, um, we're um, starting, um, we're heading to a kickoff meeting in the very near future with the environmental review contract was awarded by the council last week, so moving forward with that. And um, ultimately, 
Um, we are looking at um, a variety of things with regard to the coastal bluff, particularly poplar. Um, we're looking at um, improving the access and safety of access down poplar, um, at the poplar access down to the beach. We think we need to move that forward and, um, and address that right away. I think it's, a, it's, it's just um, difficult for a lot of people to get down there. And ultimately, the, um, the gateways master plan will be a significant undertaking which will address where should we potentially relocate and move the trail inland um, as erosion occurs and continues to occur and any number of things that we're looking at out there in terms of potentially even relocating the parking lot away from erosion, um, looking at changing um, how we approach things out there in, a many, in many ways. Thanks. So um, there are a few new projects. Those are listed here. I think one that's uh, pretty exciting for the community has been the permanent restrooms at Ocean View Park. Um, that's been something that's been um, desired for a long time, and um, the existing facilities, um, it, 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 it's a lot to be desired there. Um, so we're working on that. And then um, in this plan, and it, it, it probably means very little to most folks, but um, ultimately what this shows is, is that we shifted a lot of projects and delayed some projects and deferred some projects. I think notably you'll see some of the Smithfield projects were rolled into the Smithfield um, basically master plan implementation. So um, it really pushes back to um, we were starting to look at some very specific projects that really needed to be addressed in a, in a context of a bigger picture planning effort um, this coming year to, to look at you know, how do you, you don't want to put in a, a new paved parking lot and then take out that, a piece of that parking lot to put in a water line, for example, or to build something else and do that. So we want to be planning and thinking through these things. Thanks. Um, and then ultimately, um, you, it, is a, it is good to know the uh, school district is looking to begin work on building C reconstruction. So we'll have a better idea of where we land with the parking lot expansion um, in where the modulars are there at Cunha. And um, so that's now postponed into 1920 to allow that to move forward. Um, the community garden, someone may ask about what we've decided to do on that because it, was, it came out very clearly throughout the process of the park's master plan that we should just be looking at that more contextually with each park rather than trying to define a community um, garden site, there, but we should be looking at looking at multiple perhaps community garden sites within existing parks and existing lands that we own. Thanks. So tonight, again, um, we are asking the Planning Commission to adopt a resolution finding that the projects are consistent with the general plan. Thank you. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, John. Uh, I read the staff report. I'd like to commend you for the detail and the planning that's gone into this. And uh, I know you've addressed a lot of the issues that people are constantly raising regarding <laughs> infrastructure, sewage, um, transportation, and circulation. So and I also, in the staff report, I just want to call out the fact that the city has raised over $3 million in external funding from grants for some of these projects in the budget. That's not an easy thing to do, so I just, just want to say thank you. Do you guys have any questions? John, I have uh, just one. Uh, any of these projects that we've seen here likely to come back to the Planning Commission for review or modification? Certainly the, the master plans, any of the subsequent master plans, particularly the parks master plans, will have, you'll have a role in reviewing those and helping with the prioritization along with Parks and Rec Commission. So that's sort of clearly a dual role. Um, the Highway 1 North is going to require a CDP and environmental review. You'll be seeing that in the coming months as an example. Um, so there's any number of projects that will be coming back to you that are requiring CDPs. Um, some of these are replacements and not, and, uh, but, but um, many of these will require uh, coastal development permits and environmental review. Um, 
one of the things we have to do is find this consistent with the general plan, which also includes a circulation element that was approved not too long ago. There are a lot of projects here that address um, transportation, bike access, trails, so I, I find generally it's pretty consistent. Um, the question that I have is regard to some of the projects. We have um, visual resources on the bluff tops and uh, some of the projects in a general way talk about improvements on the bluff tops, improvements on Smithfield, including fencing. Um, is it your expectation that you're not going to make any changes to the current visual resources? You're not going to put up obstructive fencing? You're not going to block the view to the ocean with these projects? Our intention is not to, and for the most part, we're looking to repair, replace existing fencing. Um, the only area that we've been looking at, and, and any fencing that we're looking at, is the open split rail um, um, fr uh, friendly um, fencing. But um, the only areas that we may look at some expanded use is trying to use some of that to deter um, the cut across traffic that we're getting that's, that's ruining the bluff top. Um, I would, um, you know, caution folks, or at least encourage them to look at the um, the report that was done, um, and um, from NCE Nichols Consulting Engineering about the implications of all of the use of the bluff top and the walk-in. That's the only area that we're looking at, but very very limited in that regard. What we're really looking at is the gateways master plan to really focus on what that looks like, and and looking at the visual resources. And, and going through a community process with that, so that there's going to be no major, um, major activities occurring up um, in Poplar, particularly until that plan is done and approved and, and environmental completed. Very good. So the only other, I guess, comment I have, and then I'll turn it over to Commissioner Holt, is um, as we do these minor maintenance projects, some of which may not require a CDP, um, the feedback I've gotten from the community and some of the things I've seen is that some of the placement of items like trash, uh, which is trash cans are much needed, but the compactors uh, contribute to a feeling of clutter. Uh, some of the signage that we're proposing, we've already got over 50 signs along Poplar Beach in that area. Just as we look at this, maybe step back a little and look at how does this all fit together? What's the overall impact from a visual resource perspective? Um, we kind of know where the beach is. I'm not sure we need <laughs> signs on the beach <laughs> telling us how to get there. Um, so just, just a general concern that I have. I, I think that um, this, the council's clearly um, established that community um, and uh, outreach and communication is, continues to be a critical piece of, of this. And I think that Clearly, um, in some respects, we could have done a better job, and we'll continue to work on um, and on improving those efforts. You got garbage cans out quickly, so thank you for that. Hey, you know, I, I uh, last summer last summer was this was a difficult summer. I I, I got more phone calls, emails, and um, and uh, and wonderful other text messages about trash to piling up at Poplar Beach. It was beyond um, painful all last summer. So. I'm, one, I'm hoping that it's not as hot, and two, I hope these take care of some of the problem. Thank you. Brian? Okay. Uh, are there any, do uh, you have any public comments on this? I didn't see any comment cards. If you do want to speak about the capital improvement budget, this is your chance. Not seeing anybody rushing to the podium, I will close public comment and turn it back over to Commissioner Holt. Yeah, I just wanted to make a couple general comments. Um, one, I think this is great. I really appreciate the organization. Um, Part of what I appreciate having been served on the Parks and Recreation Commission and now on the Planning Commission, sort of seeing the evolution of coming um, to the city and sort of some haphazard projects that would come forward and really seeing things bundled together and sort of implementation of some of the, the planning efforts, the Parks Master Plan, the Trails Master Plan, and really seeing how um, that, that implementation is going forward. Um, also really appreciate the city's efforts to secure grant funding. I know grant funds are kind of a, you know, um, careful what you wish for sort of thing. You get more money, you have to have staff to actually manage those and implement them. 
Um, but would just like to give a plug for um, last Tuesday, uh, the state of California passed Prop 68. San Mateo County voted that in close to 70%, so there's a lot of support for that. That's funding that goes directly to parks and water improvement projects. Um, a lot of significant funding for coastal erosion, climate change, uh, parks improvements, um, so really a good opportunity for the city to position themselves to um, secure some state funding to invest in um, into our local parks here, and, and I hope our, local, our state parks will also be um, investing funds here. So um, I'm really happy to see a lot of the investments in parks and trails. Um, that's something that's a pet issue of mine and, uh, and really appreciate this. So thank you, John. Great, thank you. Um, so any other comments left? All right, can I get a motion? I would move to uh, adopt a resolution with findings that the proposed fiscal year 2018-2019 capital projects as contained in the city's five-year capital improvement program are consistent with the city's general plan. Can I get a second? Second. Can we get a voice vote? Or a roll call vote? Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, vote for Commissioner Devon. Yes. For Vice Chair Holt. Yes. And vote for Chair Hernandez. Yes. Motion passes 3-0. Okay, moving right along. Next item on the agenda. We have proposed amendments to city ordinance regulating accessory dwelling units. Jill, do you have a staff report? We do. Good evening. Um, Sarah Clark, our assistant city attorney, is with me tonight again. Um, this is our, our third... Uh, outing with the Planning Commission on uh, working towards a draft accessory dwelling unit ordinance. And um, that was also preceded by a kickoff um, presentation from San Mateo County. So we've been working on this all spring. And um, tonight we're going to uh, ask for uh, careful consideration, deliberation, and a recommendation from the Planning Commission to the City Council regarding this draft ordinance. Um, I recognize some folks who have been um, coming along with us. Uh, there was a study session back in March and we had a first draft ordinance in April. I'll try to highlight a few of the things that were discussed in the past, but for the most part, we're, we're really trying to go forward into what is intended in, in this draft ordinance. And um, based on um, public input, based on planning commission direction, and based on coordination with coastal commission staff. Uh, this is the agenda for the presentation, and um, we'll note that uh, this is a little bit different than your last two study sessions. Your um, public comment tonight is a public hearing. The ordinance was noticed as a public hearing in um, the Half Moon Bay Review, and um, we have followed all those procedures for, for moving through this, this particular step. Um, so, so background, on um, March 13th, we... Uh, had a staff report that really highlighted um, key policy issues for um, updating the city's accessory dwelling unit ordinance. And on April 25th, we looked at a first draft ordinance, which we um, fully expected to get uh, a range of input, and, and we certainly did. So, um, and, and here we are now. So we just uh, remind the group that one of the, the primary reasons why we're doing this um, is uh, it, from the local perspective is this is a city council priority, but from a um, policy perspective on a larger scale, uh, state law has um, gone well past where our ordinance is sitting and we are obligated to update our ordinance um, to comply with state law and also within the realm of Coastal Commission guidance. So um, that's uh, threading a needle a little bit, and uh, we've, we've tried to do that carefully, and we, again, look forward to your, your input on that. Um, but state law has uh, really kicked in in uh, January uh, 1st, 2017, so it's been on the books for a little while, and then Coastal Commission, we'll talk about their guidance in a second here, but they issued two guidance documents um, in 2017, the second of which was in November, and, and Frankly, I found that one to be um, pretty helpful. So we've been relying on those things. State law um, is 
directly applicable to every jurisdiction in the state um, unless they adopt their own ordinance it will supersede any other jurisdictions ordinance now we're in the coastal zone and the coastal zone has some exceptions to that but um, they're limited so um, we we are mindful of that but in a nutshell the state law updates for ADU ordinances were for expedited review um, requiring no new utility connections for accessory dwelling units which I see you're all here so I'm assuming you all know what these are um, they can be referred to as second units granny flats um, an au pair space etc cetera, etc cetera. we're, we're going to stick with ADU accessory dwelling unit because that is uh, how they're specifically defined um, the also I, I feel bad because we're not we're not showing the sort of context as a whole for these that was back in I think February that we did that and this is a, a dry ordinance discussion um, state law uh, won't uh, allow for us to have a size limit on ADUs that are wholly within which is, means that they're wholly within existing development such as you have a house and maybe you do a tenant improvement you change the configuration of the house to partition a portion of it a bedroom or two and, and convert one of the bedrooms to a kitchen for example and provide an exterior um, entrance to it uh, they they're not allowing us to limit the size of that um, and also they have directed um, accept or um, reductions in parking requirements um, we do have some discretion and we'll, uh, you'll note that um, there's parts of our staff report that uh, indicate where that's been allowed and that's really where we've um, focused most of our time on our policy discussion where we where we can have some discretion and those things are with um, various uh, zoning standards that are objective they cannot be subjective we can't do subjective design review on accessory dwelling units and they also have to be consistent with the Coastal Act and our local coastal program Coastal Commission guidance um, is, is pretty specifically said yeah update your ordinances coastal cities you, you do need to do this and um, align with state law um, that said uh, they acknowledge local control and the unique characteristics of different coastal communities insofar as um, codes and ordinances that are especially um, careful with coastal resources visual resources and coastal access those primary tenants of of the coastal act and um, coastal commission guidance also encouraged um, utilization of waivers which we don't have that tool in our code at this time um, or exemptions and we we were looking at those when appropriate and they are not always um, always appropriate we'll show um, where we um, cut that and see see what you think about that now in April uh, you had a that draft ordinance and um, the next few slides here I'm really going to focus on um, what Sarah did with her really hard work coding after um, we visited Coastal Commission staff reviewed your input and went back through community comments and we, we have this revised draft that um, we believe is reflective of, of your April meeting it also incorporates Coastal Commission staff input and we'll, we'll highlight some sections where where they were really helpful for us we had some open-ended questions and um, in particular clarifying the review process and um, some limits um, for allowances in PUDs and reserve districts we know those two things were of concern um, from Planning Commission input as well as some of our public comment at the last meeting um, so uh, I wanted to start with the review process uh, the kind of bold italics is um, what has changed since uh, what you saw uh, last time with the holy within um, we got clarification from the Coastal Commission if if someone's going to have an ADU and it's wholly within existing living space so for example that house example um, they would consider that to be exempt because they don't uh, they uh, did not consider that it would be actually def meeting the definition of development 
um, that um, got parsed against something that came up in your meeting, which was, well, what about the change of intensity of use? Because that is a component of the Coastal Act's definition of development. And that, that came out of, um, Commissioner Benjamin asked about that. So that was a, a key topic with our Coastal Commission um, colleagues. And their advice was if it's really about a change of use of the structure type. So for example, a garage conversion. The garage is not habitable space. If the intent is to change from a garage to a ADU, that's allowed, but it would need to have um, an administrative coastal development permit. And is she's going to help me? Um, there's, uh, there's a nuance there um, in that it could receive an administrative CDP. It also may qualify for an exemption, which we'll I believe you'll talk about in a second. I don't know if they will. Okay. There, there's also exemptions built into the code for small additions to yes. existing single-family residences and other structures. And so it's possible that a wholly within ADU, depending on the facts and circumstances, could also require or qualify for an right. exemption. As as long as we're not wholeheartedly changing the use of the space. Um, okay, so then um, last time we uh, talked to you about new development ADUs as well. So this is where um, the detached unit, so the cottage in the backyard, um, we believe we need to process an administrative coastal development permit. That is what we actually have been doing, although we've clarified the administrative CDP review process. And um, Coastal Commission staff is, was comfortable with that. Now, another kind of new development ADU is where you'd have an addition. And it, say it was an, a, a pop out on the, the back of a single family home. Part of the unit is included in existing living space and part of it could be in new living space. So it's kind of a combo of within and an addition. Um, we talked to you last time about options for that, and where we landed is matching what the city does now for additions to single-family homes. If the addition is equivalent to 10% or more of the existing floor area, then we do require a CDP. If it's less than that, it is exempt. So. Um, we, we would suggest just um, carrying the same thresh, threshold forward for consistency and our um, practice. And I, I personally am very comfortable with this. And if you have questions on that one, let us know. Um, it could be that we may be able to raise that threshold a little bit after the LCP update. That is a, that's a low bar. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about that in another context. Um, now these two things are um, clar clarifications and uh, uh, really helpful input for um, a little bit from our Coastal Commission folks as well. We had missed uh, a little bit of coding that is very important. Uh, many of the houses in town already have a coastal development permit. The coastal development permit was issued when they were constructed. so. This is something we already do. It just escaped my notice because it's part of our natural practice. When we get an application on a, a lot with a single family home, we're gonna go look at its permit history and see what was already done, if there's any special conditions that would uh, limit an addition, um, any, anything special about the history. So um, Sarah put this in the code. We, we absolutely need to go and look and see if there's anything about past permits that um, would affect the proposal. And then uh, the other one, uh, state law had um, quite a bit of um, options for if, if you were going to allow the streamlining for the ADU, but let's say it's a lot where it's, a, it's an undeveloped lot and the proposal is for a new single family home and an ADU. Do you streamline the ADU and not the single family home? Do you, how do you sequence them, et cetera, et cetera? We think it's most appropriate to consider them as a whole and to avoid piecemealing, and that's what we're recommending. And we don't think this is contrary really to the direction for expediting per state law because this application already requires 
a coastal development permit for the other portion of it. And frankly, all in, in most of these cases, most just about all of the development would be new, new development. Okay. Now, um, last, let's see here. I think the most important thing to note here is the existing ordinance that you have on the books now allows um, accessory dwelling units in all of the R zones, so the R1, 2, and 3, as well as the mixed-use commercial zoning districts. And the, so the, the C on all of those is commercial. The first one is downtown. The next one is commercial residential. VS is for visitor serving, and the CG is commercial general. We're not proposing any changes to that. Um, that's that's consistently moving forward with this ordinance. Now, what we are proposing, um, based on really the the direction of state law, and I, it's written about in quite a bit of detail in our staff report, is allowing accessory dwelling units um, specifically because it's not called out now in the code in other neighborhoods, um, so that developed neighborhoods. And so we do have three that have. PUD or PUDX zoning, uh, Ocean Colony, which is um, in our land use plan as the Half Moon Bay Country Club PUD, is a fully built, built out, um, just about every lot has been built except for a couple now, um, residential neighborhood with single family development. Um, it may be that its HOA doesn't allow ADUs and so then that's going to remain the truth for that that area, but um, we believe to be consistent with state law, we have to treat all the neighborhoods the same. Um, Jenna Lane is um, in the Matucci PUD, and I think there's about one or two lots that haven't been entitled yet, but it's pretty much built out. And then Pacific Ridge, um, which in your LUP is Dykstra Ranch, and actually in the zoning code it, it has the PUDX designation. So when we saw you in April, we were talking about the PUDs and um, there was concern that it was too broad and that it could allow for um, an accessory dwelling unit application to be expedited on a lot in a PUD that had not been planned yet. Our PUDs, um, the ones that haven't been developed, um, just about all of them require a specific plan for the entire um, consideration of, the, of that development. We didn't intend to end run that at all. We <laughs> assumed that was still in place. But instead of addressing it that way, we just called out the PUDs that this would be applicable to. Um, so I'm curious about your feedback. Uh, the other one is urban and open space reserve. Um, we changed the way this was addressed. There are quite a few urban and open space reserve parcels in town that um, have a single family house on them. In fact, there's quite a few that are non-conforming in lot size. And the non-conforming regulations have been, um, how to say, they're a bit troublesome to um, implement. There's, uh, there's some vagueness. There has, there's actually, through our research, I've found um, a wide range of past practice in how um, permits were issued for additions to them. And so our recommendation here is to allow an ADU on one of these, these properties only if it already has a single family home, not, not as a way to um, develop a lot that doesn't have any, anything on it yet. And the reason why is and most of these lots are nonconforming and the intent of nonconforming regulations is really to phase out what's there. And so we don't want to allow too much, and yet we do want to be consistently fair about allowing for um, upgrading of the property and um, remodeling and um, that kind of thing. And it's, it's really been a challenge. So you will notice that um, that specific language about only if there's already an existing single family home, not just a proposed one, which is distinct from the other zones, and that we've put in an FAR cap. Um, those lots can be significantly larger than your R1 lots. And so we're trying to um, 
maintain consistency in terms of how big can your house be and at the same time not deferring out to an R1 because our FAR is 50%. So if you had a standard lot of 6,000 square feet, you could have a 3,000 square foot house in an R1 area. Um, but if we're out in uh, these reserve areas, the lots can be, um, although they're non-conforming, they, they might still be over an acre. And a half an, a, a 0.5 FAR is not an appropriate tool <laughs> for that. So you'll, there was quite a bit of method to what we intended to do. It is based on um, case studies, um, you know, things that have challenged us in the past of trying to help applicants do the right thing on these properties. And um, we were comfortable with this recommendation. I would really like to have this code cleared up. This, this would help staff. Um, okay, parking. We talked about parking quite a bit last time. The key here is um, the state law direction is that um, every property within a half mile of a transit stop won't need to provide the parking space. And because of you heard the about our unique geography during public comment tonight, that's exactly correct. And with a bus stop along Highway 1 um, next to every single neighborhood, almost every parcel in town is within a half mile radius of a transit stop. And that would mean if we, if we took that um, straight up off of, off of the state law guidance um, for this, we, we wouldn't require any parking for, for any of these ADUs. We're concerned about that and we've talked about that. Um, and we are allowed to deviate from those um, specific state law if there is a um, nexus to um, imp our coastal, um, coastal Act as well as our LCP. And in this case, we think there is a connection in um, parking impacted neighborhoods that are near the beach. We know they get pretty crowded on a, on a sunny day. So we shared with you um, a map last time, and this time we actually um, put in the code some boundaries. I've actually changed my mind about one of these <laughs> over the weekend. I've been spending a lot of time on my bike tooling around these neighborhoods just to see how it's functioning. Of course, this last weekend was really windy, and um, we didn't have a lot of folks um, at the beach like we do on some other weekends. That said, I also get phone calls about um, from neighbors after a really sunny weekend telling me how um, dreadful it is to live on their street because of all the beach parking. So um, that is why this um, first first cut here um, we, we talked about last time and, and then have uh, revised it a little bit. There are four neighborhoods where we're proposing to maintain the requirement for that parking place because if we if you don't require the parking place um, the car associated with the household living in the ADU will be on the street and so that's where we we feel like we we may have an impact to our coastal access so I can um, run through what's proposed here and then I do want to share a little bit of a revision of a recommendation um, on the north end of the map is really the entire neighborhood of Miramar within the city's limits. Miramar has um, parking permits. It's, it's known to have a fairly intense amount of uh, parking going on. I, I would maintain that recommendation. Um, down uh, where you see that L, those two blue lines in Casa del Mar, one of the lines is on Wave and the other is on Pilarcitos. I am not as concerned about um, the entire span of either of those streets um, as I am about uh, when we go farther south, Kelly, for example. Um, we know folks park on Wave and Pillar Cito's near the corner where those two meet, and there's, there's a walkway out to the coastal trail in that area. Um, I don't get very many complaints from the neighborhood we do see folks parking uh, along Wave in, in this kind of an open space area 
on the north side of the street. Um, but I would, I would suggest either eliminating this or uh, probably reducing it. But I, I think the community, you guys are the experts on your neighborhoods. So I, I'm expecting a little surgical precision to come out of um, community input. Um, going south, Alsace Lorraine and Arleta Park are mapped together. That blob includes both sides of Kelly Avenue from Balboa to Pilarcitos and then Poplar from, um, I think it's Pacific, up to Third, and maybe that's going too far east. Um, but boy, do we get a lot of phone calls about Poplar on a hot day. And then the, <coughs> um, so those are the corridors, but then the, the bulk of it is Railroad Avenue to the west, Kelly north, and then um, Potter, and then, unfortunately, the, the street doesn't go through nicely, so that's where that little bump is. And um, it's uh, Alsace Lorraine to um, First, um, where, it, where it transitions there. Um, I've had uh, phone calls about that entire north area um, from Kelly all the way down to Valdez between Poplar and Railroad, and I have seen that. I don't know. Um, what kind of input we'll get about that, but I, um, I just have anecdotal, so I was comfortable with that recommendation. I'm interested in any and all feedback, though, on these, um, but I would, I would back off my recommendation on Casa Del Mar. Um, Short-term rentals. So I do want to note, uh, it's a good point to do this. We have received three comment letters on the ADU ordinance. Um, two of them were in your packet. One was expressing uh, great concern about, um, about this ordinance and um, also the relationship to short-term rentals. We received a um, very supportive letter from Seacrest School that was also in your packet. And then just this afternoon, we received email correspondence from um, Timothy Pond, who has spoken at um, quite a few of your study sessions, and he is sorry that he couldn't come tonight. So we, we did want to make sure that you, and maybe when you take public comment, you'll spend a minute to um, take a look at this new correspondence that you haven't had a chance to see yet. Um, that said, Timothy's um, input, as well as the other gentleman's um, relating to short-term rentals and input that we received from some of the folks who are here tonight um, at the April session um, affected the recommendation that is in the draft ordinance. And we also offer some other considerations and um, we've done additional thinking about this. So we know that it's still an area of um, interest. What you see in the draft is uh, a grandfathering, basically, of any existing short-term rental that is operating out of an accessory dwelling unit in compliance with um, paying the city's um, transient occupancy tax, which is really our only tool right now in advance of a future ordinance, which will have some land use controls. Um, we looked through our records. I, 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 it's hard to know exactly what we see because um, we're, we're combing the websites and looking at pictures and we can't always tell the configurations of different sites. I think there's fewer than 10 of these conditions. So it's um, for, for having the ADU being used as a short-term rental. What we were seeing mostly was whole house um, short-term rentals in our, in our study. But um, so uh, grandfathering a small number is, is not a huge concern. Why we are proposing and why we proposed in April to not allow ADUs to be used as short-term rentals comes back to the purpose of, of the ordinance. The, the intent is to provide affordable housing and um, that is the whole, um, just why the state did this law and why we're trying to do this. And this, from a county perspective, um, the um, emphasis has been on affordability by design 
really studying all the different cities processes in, in San Mateo County. There's 20 of us plus the county, so the, the 21 jurisdictions locally. Um, how much it costs to process an application for an EDU through each jurisdiction, how long it takes, what kind of hearings, what kind of review does it go through, and to um, be, uh, the county's really been supportive uh, with tools. They actually have an online tool for estimating what it would cost to build one of them. And so it's, it's that emphasis. Um, 13 of the 21 jurisdictions do not allow using ADUs for short-term rentals. The others um, allow them to some extent, some much more generously than others. I have not studied them all to the nth degree. So the bottom line here is it's best practice to not allow it, but that said, we're also in the coastal zone. And so, um, and, and we also uh, really appreciate the uh, kind of other consequence of allowing an STR um, in an ADU as, as supporting income and um, helping affordable house, uh, housing affordability for the main unit for um, the homeowner. So there's a lot of nuance to um, whether or not short-term rentals are taking housing stock out of, out of our inventory, and it, it really depends on how they're done. So um, we've had input about just allowing it generally. Don't worry about it. You don't have very many. It's not going to be a concern. Um, another control would be to require owner occupancy of the home to make sure that you don't have both the home and the ADU um, used in short-term rental mode. Then you really do lose some housing stock. Um, in our opinion, or to allow it for small ADUs. That came up at your last meeting. Um, we pitched that as an option in the staff report. Um, I'm going to share my recommendation a little bit because I, I expect to get public comment on it, and I think it, I'm happy to have, I'm happy to be corrected <laughs> and schooled on this. But um, generally, um, I like the grandfathering that we're suggesting to you. If you want to do more, um, I'm more comfortable. Uh, I, I'm not, I, I would be very concerned about just allowing it outright while we're still going to be working on our short-term rental ordinance. You, you can go back and rebite this apple at that point in time. It's hard to move a code from a more liberal position to a more conservative position. It's easier to go the other way. So I'm uncomfortable with number one. If you like two or three, we can um, also talk about those as well. I would prefer to implement two or three later, but um, we just share that with you. So I know there's going to be lots of input. We're eager to hear it. Um, other things that we changed, um, really minor um, bit here, we had input from um, Commissioner Evans in particular about uh, the objective design standards. His concern was making everything match for a detached unit when you could have a really cool detached unit and why would you limit that creativity? So we took that out for the detached unit, left it in for an addition to a house because that made a lot of sense. Commissioner Evans has communicated with me. He's really pleased with this and also um, just having the height limits be controlled by the heights allowed in the zoning district. We don't need special height limits for ADUs. So those were two things that, that he appreciated. And of course, he's an architect, so we appreciated his input. Um, procedural requirements that might, I don't, I don't know if they um, captivated you when you were reading the draft ordinance, but these things are important to staff and Coastal Commission staff. Um, it's nice when our projects don't surprise them, especially if they're in the appeals jurisdiction or we're granting exemptions. And we don't have a standard procedure for notification. We do notify them. We're great at it. We're, we're pretty chummy with them. But we said, oh, yeah, we'd be perfectly fine to codify that process. And um, so you'll see this actually applies not just to ADUs, but all CDP exemptions to, ha to have, a co have a process. And we've already 
prepared our form and we're we're already doing it. So um, we're we don't have that many, so it, it's going to be fine for staff load. And then notifying you, the planning commission and city council, um, each time there is an administrative uh, coastal development permit granted for an ADU, so that um, you're aware of it and you can um, ask for review of it if, if you have concerns. But the ordinance is going to be so great that you'll never have any concerns. That's a performance standard for the ordinance. It's how many call-ups you do. Um, this has not changed. Um, the existing ordinance that's on the books today has a 700 square foot limit in the size of a detached accessory dwelling unit. Um, we're proposing 800 square feet. We talked about this quite a bit. I'm just going to keep clicking. Everyone seemed pretty comfortable with this. Um, we didn't go bigger. I do, I do want to share this. We did not go bigger because the intent is to be affordable by design. And once these things get really big, they're about as big as some of our smaller homes. And we are not sure why we'd want to do that. It seems out of scale. So, um, And we were allowed to have that discretion. We talked about Measure D last time. We did not change that. We thought you were comfortable with what we had done, counting the units, issuing the certificates, not charging for, the, for these certificates, and having a point system that's appropriate for um, acknowledging ADU. So if, if we had a competitive situation, they, they could compete. Um, Occupancy requirements. We also did not change this since we saw you last time. We did have some input on this at both of your study sessions. Um, this on, on the code right now, the city requires uh, recordation that either, either the single family home or the ADU needs to be owner occupied. And the sort of most most codes have that this is sort of part of a some old standard ordinance that everybody was using i i think I, yes um but we're seeing a trend to taking that restriction away and in fact san mateo county when they did their ordinance um, they took that out of their code at your study session in march we had a lot of um, input about this that um I, I didn't know it was a big deal, and I pitched it. I, we don't think this is a big deal. And people went, no, this is a really big deal. We don't like this restriction. So then we put it in the draft ordinance. We, we removed this restriction, and we got some input in April that was a little more mixed. We left it alone, but we just want to acknowledge that, that that's, what we, that's really what's been going on in this discussion in this forum here. Um, so that, those were the highlights of what's changed, unless I've missed anything key. The intent for the rest of this um, evening here then is uh, to give the Planning Commission a chance to ask us any clarifying questions, um, and then to hold a public hearing. And clo upon closing that, um, the Planning Commission will have time for deliberation and we're hoping you'll be able to make a decision, and our, our recommendation is that you would um, recommend this ordinance for um, uh, adoption by city council. You're a recommending body for this to the city council. Um, and you can also, um, if, if there's modifications you wish to make, you can recommend the ordinance with those modifications. So if it isn't perfect tonight, you can, you can tweak it. So that's all in your purview. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. That was very thorough. Um, comments or questions from my fellow commissioners? Yeah, there, there are certainly questions or issues, but I'd really like to hear from the uh, public before we uh, do that. I mean, there's there are things I can change my mind, so at least from my standpoint, uh, I, I'd like to preserve judgment and, until I hear from other people uh, on this. So. Very good. Yeah, one question, Jill. So you referenced the sh potential short-term rental ordinance that may be coming back at some point. Can you just describe that a little bit more, maybe what the scope of that might be, what might be included in there, timing, anything along those lines? Or Thank 
you. So we had a study session and discussed some of the key policy points for what might be included in short-term um, rental ordinance back in March when we did the ADU session. Some of the key components, because there's, there's a lot of pieces to it, but the, the very key pieces, and these are the ones that uh, we just saw the Coastal Commission um, spend a lot of time discussing for the city of Del Mar's uh, short-term rental ordinance just last Thursday. How many days a year maximum and a minimum stay? Um, those, those two things are really key. And then the other one is um, those two things to amounts apply to whether um, it's hosted, uh, which we're going to be recommending very little limitations for that, versus unhosted. And then that's, that's where most of the cities are, are looking for some, some limits. So those are the key bits. So just so I understand and for the public, so you mentioned that. Yeah. Um, there would be another bite of the apple, so there would be potential for some sort of a discretionary permit or something along those lines or something that would... The bite of the apple I was thinking about for your short-term rental ordinance discussion would be if we had more learning about um, the connection with ADUs and any more concerns because you could at that same time make an adjustment to to this draft ordinance and that would be perfectly fine to do there's there's a lot of relationships between the two um there would be a review process for for each short-term rental um absolutely yep. just to clarify brian's question um the city is looking to revise the short-term rental regulations more generally, yes? The city um, has only policy right now for collecting TOT and for um, requiring a business license for operators. Mm -hmm. We don't have any land use zoning code ap applicable to short-term rentals right now. Um, so Brian asked the question of, um, we are planning to put in place some regulations. Yes. And do we have a time frame when we expect uh, that to happen within the next year, within the next five mm -hmm. years? Can you give us some general guidance? The concern is that there are a number of folks, including Mr. Pond, um, who are concerned about, well, are we locking ourselves, you know, locking up things in an unnecessary yeah. way when in fact, I think the point you made is if we're a little more restrictive right now, this gives us enough time to get everything lined up, make sure we're not um, making a big mistake in some way, and then within the next six to 12 months, we'll have a more clean, clarified policy that's consistent with the Coastal Commission. Can you give me feedback on where that's going? I think we're looking at about six months on the outside. I, I think the, the crafting of the code, because Sarah's amazing at it, is, is gonna go quick. We do need to do um, a lot more outreach with our operators, and so you're going to see that start to happen after this ADU ordinance, but we would like it done by the end of this calendar year. How did you settle on the 30-day rental period for the grandfathered units over a six-month period? The reason why I ask that question is if you're renting um, units generally in the summer, if you rented them last summer, and we pass the ordinance now, or the city council approves the ordinance, people would not have rented during their normal rental period. Sure, so the goal with the 30 days within the um, previous six months um, is to ensure that people don't get wind of what we're doing and then you know, went to the short-term rental for one night and therefore qualify for the um, grandfathering provision. Um, that number of 30 days within six months is just a back of the envelope calculation. We are very welcome to public feedback on that and if you think it's too restrictive, then we can change that number easily moving forward. And if we did it for say a 12 month period, you don't think that'd make a material difference? Just Sure, it, it, may, it makes sense that if, um, if there are cyclical uh, rentals in, in Half Moon Bay, then 12 months might be more appropriate. Okay. 
those are the only clarifying questions I have. I'd like to uh, open it up for public comment unless there are other points you wish to make. Okay. So, um, <coughs> Matt DeTome, followed by John Crook. Thank you. Please make sure the green light is on and that you're, you can be heard in the microphone. Hi, thank you very much. My name is Matt DeTom. I am on 307 Grove Street. Uh, I just want to say that I'm, I'm very impressed tonight with the level of care and thoughtfulness that goes into this amendment. I think it's a great amendment. Uh, I'm neighbors with many of the people here in Arlita Park, uh, including Rick and Brian, uh, and Ronaldo and Cynthia, and John and Tim. Uh, Housing is important to us. My mother's a teacher. Uh, my sister and brother-in-law who live on Medsker are both teachers. Uh, many of our friends are teachers. Um, I have a student at Hatch, um, or a, a child at Hatch. Housing is very important to us. For the sake of this community, I think we absolutely need affordable housing. We don't pay our teachers enough, and we need affordable housing. That being said, I'm also an Airbnb operator. Um, it helps me live in this expensive community. Um, I feel like the we can live concurrently. I, I feel we, I, I live on Magnolia now. There's eight, I think last time I spoke, there's eight or nine people that have ADUs on Magnolia, uh, west of Highway 1. None of them today have Airbnbs. Tim has a... Uh, uh, a, a place on Magnolia. My mom lives on Magnolia. None of those people have ADUs. I don't feel like there's an overwhelming problem with ADUs being used as Airbnbs or short-term rentals. Um, so I'm, I'm here to advocate that we might, it might be mistaken to try and regulate short-term rentals via the ADU regulation. Um, I feel like what we need is hundreds more ADUs in this community to make an impact on housing, right? So let's say I, I, I just moved from Grove to Magnolia. My house is a two bedroom, two bath house. I need a guest bedroom. It's gonna cost me about $200,000 to build an ADU on that piece of land. It's a 10,000 square foot lot I have a 1,200 square foot house on there, no garage. My proposal, I want to build a garage plus an ADU combined. Uh, that, you know, I, and I don't, would not, I, I can't use that as a guest bedroom if I use that as a long-term rental. Um, I feel, so that's very selfish reasons. My mother is also in a rental unit right next to me between Tim and I. She is looking to buy. She's retired. Uh, she, to, for us to be able to afford a house for my mom, I would like her to be able to have an ADU or build an ADU in the back to help her be in this community. Um, that's it. Thank you, Matt. John Crook, followed by Warren Woolfield. Well, um, <laughs> you know, I don't have much to say. Matt covered most of what I was thinking, but uh, I'll, I'll second what, what Matt mentioned. Uh, I live right now, I'm renting on uh, 207 Filbert, and I'm looking to buy a house. I, I think I could probably get into a two bedroom, maybe three bedroom. I've got uh, three kids that are going off to college and coming back, and age, two sets of aged parents. So, it, so slightly different, but similar situation where I need that flexibility to um, have another uh, another room. I don't think I'll be able to afford to buy a four bedroom house or a five bedroom house or plus. Um, so, and then, but then, then we then we're, we're faced with the construction cost. I'm not sure where it is. Let's say it's between a hundred thousand and two hundred thousand. I would make that investment easier or, or easily if I knew I could bring some revenue in off of it through short-term rentals to offset the cost. 
Now, if I couldn't do that or I was limited in doing that, I wouldn't make that investment or it'd be very difficult or very risky. So it's, it's something I think Matt is right. We need more uh, short-term rentals and ADUs. And um, that I think that would um, help with the, the, uh, the, we're stuck right now, right? We need long-term rentals and we need, we need that to be affordable. But I think it's a supply issue. And uh, I don't think we want to fetter that, that type of individual investment. Thanks. Thank you. Warren Woolfield, followed by Linda Ponsini. Hi. I wanted to make a suggestion. I don't know if it's too late to include in this ordinance or maybe it needs to be in a future ordinance. But it seems to me that um, there is something we can do to increase the number of ADUs by a small amount. And that is, um, I'm thinking of the, uh, the large number of homes that are being built right now at the end of Terrace Avenue. 65 homes, 3,000 square feet, on approximately, you know, close to $2 million each one. Those buyers buying those homes are all coming from over the hill. It's not doing anything to reduce the pressure on housing here in Half Moon Bay. What if in the future we were to require that any home that is going to be 3,000 feet or more is required to have a built-in ADU? Whether they use it for that or not is besides the point, but at least it'll be there and it'll be legal. And that's my suggestion. Thank you. Linda Ponsini, followed by Mike Farrar. Good evening, commissioners. Um, um, thank you. I, I was uh, also very impressed by this ordinance, and it looks like you've done a lot of good work on it. Um, I really appreciated the fact that you explained um, how the parking was going to work, because my first concern in reading the earlier drafts was what's going to happen with the parking and that there would be parking all over the street. But it seems like that, that it is uh, being looked at carefully. Um, I think that um, the, the one thought that I um, did like was the option of the um, owner occupancy of one of the units, either the single family home or the ADU. Um, that um, I think that would, would help for the neighborhoods that uh, to know that, that the owner is there and that um, the unit is being supervised by the person who is actually, um, who owns the, the house and, and is looking after things. Um, and I do think that it's, it's important that the ADUs will actually provide longer-term affordable housing so that someone can actually live here for years in one of these smaller units. And um, I think that if there's a way to encourage that, um, that that's important. That's, that's how you build a community is for people who will actually be able to live here and stay here and grow up here and have a small unit that they can actually afford to live in. Um, so thank you for that. And um, I think that it's, I like the idea better of the um, minimum 30-day rentals because, again, I think that encourages residents of the city who couldn't afford to live here otherwise to be able to live here. Um, for a shorter-term rental, someone can afford to pay a lot of money per night if they're only here one night or two nights. But if someone wants to actually live here full time, it's better if their rental unit can be rented for a longer period of time or that there is a restriction on that. But if it's something that is going to be addressed in other ordinances coming up, then maybe that's a better place to, um, to do it. Um, the <laughs> The only other thing I'll say is I thought it was kind of ironic that there was a, 
something in the ordinance that says these um, 800 square foot ADUs have to prove they're not going to adversely impact public views or vistas to the ocean from Highway 1. But uh, what about a hotel and RV park? Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Former chairman and former mayor, Mike Farrar, followed by Paul Gregoriev. Good evening again, Chair Hernandez and commissioners. Uh, first, I, I think there's a lot of good work here. Let me, let me say that. And uh, I'm uh, particularly pleased to see that you've worked out our unique situation with Measure D, or more properly, Measure A slash D. And so that all of these new uh, units would be counted against Measure D, not restricted by Measure D, counted against Measure D. So you've done a good job on that. I want to express my appreciation for that. But I have to get to the PUDs. My understanding was that this, what we're going through here, was an attempt to bring our ordinance up to speed with state law. That we were not specifically charged with going beyond state law, but just up to state law. And so I think that we have now come around to the fact that uh, the state doesn't actually require us to zone PUDs for this, but there's some other part of state law that may require us or kind of sort of pushes us in that direction. And my problem with that is that the th there are 19 PUDs, and of the three that were selected, one, Mariucci, I believe, is already has permitted requirements for ADUs. So we don't have to get that one. Pacific Ridge, we mentioned just earlier, that's a settlement. That's a court settlement. And the Coastal Commission and the City Council negotiated from 197 down to 63. And the people on Terrace were still angry because really the development wasn't originally planned to go down Terrace. To this day, they're angry. And I don't think they know that this is happening tonight. I'm busy with things. I don't have to go tell them. But when they find out that we're effectively doubling it, and we are doing that because they're 10,000 foot lots with 5,000 foot houses on them. So yeah, I mean, these are gonna be built there if we put it into this ordinance. And then we get to Ocean Colony, which is in my storied career, I was once actually president of that association. And, uh, what a hornet's nest to get into. The private community with narrow streets where you get your car towed if you leave it on the street at night. It's a no parking place. Uh, they have the front gate. They have special entitled arrangements relative to the golf course and the, uh, even to the hotel and the restaurant and the swimming pool and all of that. It's very complicated out there. And they have their own, as you mentioned, uh, architecture review committee that under their CCNRs has a lot of strength. But there's bills moving in the assembly. If you want to go up to the assent to the not assembly, the legislative uh, bill finder and put in accessory dwelling unit and hit search, you get a page full of bills currently in motion for ADUs. One of which, by the way, I'd like to congratulate you. You picked 800 feet. There's one bill in there that will forbid cities from anything requiring anything less than 800 feet. OK. So nice. You know, you're not going to have to make that change. That's uh, a bill by Wiener and Wikowski. And uh, it's already passed the Senate, and uh, it's in the Assembly, and almost certainly will get passed. 
But there's other weird stuff in there too that says that private communities can't re do all kinds of things, like even require parking. And uh, I think you're gonna find that there's stuff that's in motion that's gonna stop us from requiring any parking as well. Everybody's in on this in the legislature. So I beg of you, please, if you feel you can do it, please don't put those three PUDs in this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Paul? And if anybody else would like to speak, um, you can fill out a green card later, but I think we've hit just about everybody in the room. This may sound, <clears throat> excuse me, a little repetitive. Um, I, 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 four questions occurred to me as the, uh, the commissioners and the staff were talking. And I wanted to ask, and, and Mike sort of touched on this, is it correct that state law does not override HOA, CCNRs, for example, the ones in Ocean Colony? Uh, and because that would make a big difference in Ocean Colony, I believe. Uh, overnight, as Mike touched on, overnight on-street parking is prohibited in, o in Ocean County, where I happen to live. Uh, and so parking, uh, would not parking spaces need to be required if that PUD was to be opened up to ADUs? Um, and I wonder, what does our legislation say about ADUs and required setbacks? Does it have any provisions that would allow the construction of ADUs to override existing state back, uh, setbacks? Or does state law? Uh, this is a, a real concern in Ocean Colony as well. And recently we ran into a, a funny kink in state law having to do with solar power. Uh, apparently, if you're implementing a solar project, you can override almost everything. Zoning goes out the window. There are no concerns with regard to uh, what you can put on what size lot. So all I have to do, I think, to avoid all this is just put a solar unit on the roof of my little ADU. I think that's worth looking into. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. I filled out one of these already. Please. Okay. All right. So um, I wanted to kind of address that parking thing in Miramar. I live in Miramar, and that's going to be one of the um, the uh, places that's excluded from or, or included. That you, we, you have to have additional parking. Now, I'm kind of a little confused about that because um, – it already seems like we got a bunch of parking signs in Miramar restricting parking already, and you drive through, especially the neighborhood of Miramar that's behind Via Uno, um, and I don't believe there's any on-street parking allowed there anyway, right? And I wonder why. We have a couple of beach parks in that area, and that's where people go and park uh, to get to the beach. The roads are very wide in that neighborhood, and yet there's no on-street parking allowed. And now we're going to make people that have, just by the way, I do have an Airbnb in my home. They share my bathroom. I have a room in my, my, my house. Um, but if somebody in that neighborhood wanted to have, and I don't live in that part of Miramar. I live behind um, the barn in that neighborhood. So, but if somebody wanted to have an, an a, a, yeah. Um, an ADU in the area behind Via Uno, now they have to provide a parking spot for it when there's streets and streets in that neighborhood that doesn't, that they can't, even, they're not even allowed to park on the streets. I remember when somebody new moved into my neighborhood and they wanted to restrict the parking close to the beach and because they said that a lot of peop visitors came and parked in that neighborhood. And um, they wanted some, no overnight parking, but they also wanted some restrictions that I felt were a little bit unrealistic. That because we live in these neighborhoods, possibly upscale neighborhoods, we don't have to open up our 
our area to other people that are visiting. And I didn't think that was right. Um, so what I think we're going to be doing by ex excluding or including or whatever you call it, Miramar, you're all here's these big houses in Miramar and they don't allow on-street parking already and now if you want to have an ADU in that neighborhood you're going to have to provide off-street parking that that doesn't make a lot of sense to me so I'd like you to take a, a take another look at that and also ride through those neighborhoods I ride through that neighborhood all the time and I don't see an overabundance of parking what I see is a prejudice of visitors or other people from other neighborhoods being restricted to park in that area and I don't think that's right um, okay, and then I just want to make one real quick point about, I think you said that if you were going to do a um, add-on to a house, it could only be 10% of the size of that house. So that means a, a house that's 3,000 or 5,000 square feet can have 10% of that added on, but a smaller house, even though it might be on a bigger lot in Miramar especially, is a $2,000, a 2,000 square foot house is only going to be allowed a, 2, 000, a 200 square foot addition, yet a four or 5,000 square foot house could have a four. This doesn't make a lot of sense. Okay. And I could go on and on. And I encourage you to read Tom Pond's uh, letter, make sure everybody's familiar with that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, point of clarification on the comment that was just made, the 10% rule, um, that applies to, you have to get a CDP if your project, uh, the, the changes exceed 10% of your existing structure, correct? Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, update, I guess. Update, yeah. And, and through Up the to 800 square feet. That's right. And through the chair, uh, there were quite a few questions that came up and some of them were um, particularly legal, and Sarah can field them if you'd like us to do that before your discussion. Yes, please. Thank you. Sure. Um, so I will just address the four questions that Paul just raised. Um, so the first question was whether it's correct that state law um, does not override HOA covenants related to restrictions on accessory dwelling units. Currently, state law does not have any uh, override authority over those covenants. As alluded to, the state legislature is currently considering a ADU bill that would have such an override. Um, it's passed the Senate. I can't remember which one. It, it, it's passed one house of the state legislature. And so if that passes, then there may be an override for those um, covenants. Let me ask with that question. So basically, Ocean Colony, which has CCNRs and the other ones, we don't have to include them, or we have a choice of including them or not? So our recommendation is to include them because state law uh, directs cities to allow ADUs on any um, lots that are zoned for single family or multifamily use. And since our PUD lots are zoned for single family or multifamily use, those should be included. Um, and so for in, the, under the current status quo, we would be allowing them in Ocean Colony per the zoning code, and then private restrictions would restrict them, namely the CCNRs. And so as a practical matter, for the time being, um, there would be no um, ADUs in Ocean Colony, but it would be up to the HOA to enforce that rule. It's not something that's per the city's code. Okay, again, just for... Uh to, to be clear here, if Ocean Colony had in their CCNRs no ADUs, it would be moot to include them. But if they don't have any prohibition, then including them would qualify them under the rules we are currently proposing. Is that correct? Um, I, the, the issue is I wouldn't say that it's moot. I mean, it's moot as a practical matter, but the issue here is we can't control what Ocean Colony has in its CCNRs, we being the city. And so as a matter of state law, we've been directed to zone for ADUs in any lots that are for single family zones. So that's what this ordinance does. So as a point of clarification on that, if um, we have an obligation to come up to standard with state law, 
uh, we do not have an obligation to make these additional changes to the PUDs. And at some point in the future, if state law changes to address these corner cases, including the HOAs, then we would be obligated to address Ocean Colony in the future. We believe you currently have the obligation to do so now. Um, because this is a question of um, what your ordinance says on the books, that there's an obligation to make your ordinance consistent which with, with, with what state law requires. Okay, thank you. Um, do, I will also turn to the other three questions that were raised. Um, so the next question was about uh, overnight street parking is currently prohibited in Ocean Colony. Again, as we just discussed, this is, this is a um, sort of non-issue for the time being because uh, per Ocean Colony's private regulations, there would be no ADU applications, and so parking would not be an issue um, for the time being. Um, sure. We could consider requiring something different for parking in PUDs in that they are visual resource areas, um, specifically cited as such in your LCP. And so maybe there's a way to conform the parking regs based on compliance with our Coastal Act and LCP. And I, I th we could take a look at that. So that's. That's a little caveat, maybe special to the PUDs. Um, so let, me, let me just restate that. Mm -hmm. um, you've got four areas where you're recommending putting in a parking requirement for currently, what's written in the statute now. One, you're hedging a little bit on, which is the L uh, in Cas Casa del Mar. Right now, we're not requiring any parking in Ocean Colony if we <laughs> say that you have to have a PUD. Is that correct? Or did I get, okay, great. Okay, can you clarify the other Yes, questions? sure. Uh, the third question was about whether um, state law has any um, sort of preemptive effects over the city's ability to regulate setbacks. Um, for the most part, the city is permitted to apply its standard setbacks to ADUs. Uh, which is what this ordinance does. There are some uh, nuanced requirements related to setbacks for existing garages and setbacks um, for already existing structures. In those instances, the city has limits on the setbacks that it can impose, and those are included in the draft ordinance. Um, but it is in, in only those limited areas. And this is another place I would caveat that the legislature is tinkering with this. We may be back with a different requirement in the future. Um, and then the fourth question uh, was about the solar, solar, solar facilities. Um, so I believe you're referencing the Solar Rights Act, um, which does limit the ability of both local jurisdictions and individuals to um, limit the ability of folks to build solar facilities. Um, I, this is a caveat that I have not looked at that law recently. My understanding of it is that it only applies to the solar facilities themselves, so you couldn't combine a solar facility with an ADU to sort of sneak it in under um, a process by which the city would have no review authority. But if there's further questions about the Solar Rights Act, I could come back with more detailed information. Very good. Thank you. Um, I had a just a procedural question uh, before we get into other things. Um, when we When we pass, presumably we, we are going to approve this. This is then going to go to city council for final approval. And so what's the time frame on that process that you would expect? It, depending on what you do tonight, if, if uh, you recommend uh, moving this to council with a limited number of changes, we would like to turn it around pretty quickly to get it to council as soon as they're... Um, July 17th meeting. They really want this and they have to do two readings. So that could be an introduction of the ordinance and then uh, a second reading could be in August. Very good, thank you. And then it has to go to the Coastal Commission. Okay. Brian? Any questions? No questions. Les? Okay, are we going to deliberation here? I mean, that would... Yeah. Uh, you can move to okay. deliberation unless you have other questions for... No. Uh, All right, so let's move to deliberation. 
So, you know, the, I think the explanations that we've gotten that uh, we've seen an ordinance here that compile, uh, complies with what we're required to do by the state. And um, I heard issues about the uh, PUDs, but uh, I think uh, given what I've heard, uh, uh, those need to be included in here. So uh, my, I guess, primary uncertainty, and I go back and forth, as uh, I heard Jill does, is how to talk about the uh, short-term rentals and ADUs. Now, I also heard that we're going to be, in effect, maybe getting a, another bite of the apple here. Um, now, to build an ADU is not going to be cheap. Uh, I guess in some cases it might be cheaper than others. If it's a separate unit, certainly it's going to be uh, uh, costly given building costs here, four or $500 a square foot. Uh, so the question is, you know, how do you pay for these? Uh, if you can rent those out uh, at a good uh, price, uh, I think that's one way to do it. But, uh, you know, when it comes to uh, short-term rentals, having the owner move into the short-term into the ADU for a few days where they rent out the other portion of the house, I mean, there's all kinds of ways to kind of game this. Um, so um, putting things in very black and white, I'm not sure is enforceable uh, here. Uh, so I'm just trying to get other input from my fellow commissioners here on what we can do here that, in effect, uh, uh, enhances the intent that we've heard from the uh, people here in the audience and others to increase the amount of uh, low-cost housing here, but yet uh, don't come into cross-purposes with the short-term rentals. I mean, I don't see us passing this having all of a sudden 200 applications because we haven't had those in the past and we've had ADU or ordinances here. So I think all we're doing here is kind of uh, taking what we have and trying to comply with uh, state rules. And I think the big issues that are going to come up are with the short-term rentals, not necessarily with this here. So I'm just trying to figure out whether the language you have here, which is uh, 1833030 under H, I guess page 329 of attachment two that says, the accessory dwelling unit may be rented in full or in part for the purpose of overnight lodging for a term of 30 days or more con consecutive days, but it shall not be rented for overnight Okay, is that better? Okay, so um, we have a, 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 a 1833.030, <clears throat> pardon my hoarseness. Uh, it says here that the accessory dwelling unit may be rented in full or in part for the purpose of overnight lodging for a term of 30 or more consecutive days, but shall not be rented for overnight lodging for shorter terms or sold or otherwise con conveyed. So I'm trying to think whether th those words here are uh, uh, sufficient with the intent of what we want to do here. So that's what I'm trying to get input on. And uh, you know, I <coughs> will, will that work for now? And should we wait for the STR ordinance or should we change this in any way, shape or form? That's what I mean, I think there's two questions, right? So the first one is, if somebody's already following the law, or between now and July 17th is in conformance with the law, so they get themselves right if they haven't been paying their taxes or following the rules, then those people would be grandfathered in. The city has established that there's about 10 people that they're aware of. There's probably more who I expect would come forward and pay their taxes and follow the, get in conformance with the rules. Um, but outside of that, I mean, 
I think the obligation we have is to provide long-term housing that's affordable. It's not, and, and in, we're going through the process of liberalizing and streamlining the ADU process. I'd be very cautious about all of a sudden opening everything up. And, and given that we've got um, you know, six months or so, we're probably gonna have a revised ordinance. I, I think this is fine. I guess my question to the city attorney is you've modeled this after best practices from somewhere else. You didn't create this from whole cloth, right? Yeah, so I, I think this is sufficient for that purpose. Um, Brian, I'm curious what your questions are. Um, <coughs> no necessary questions. I wanna, you know, I wanna state, and I guess I just wanna, um, just in the interest of full disclosure, you mentioned um, I have met with Tim Pond um, and have talked with him about an accessory dwelling unit um, on my property. Um, haven't necessarily considered whether that would be for a short-term rental or a long-term rental and um, haven't done anything more than that. But, uh, but I, um, in general, I mean, I fully support the concept of providing more housing within the developed footprint of Half Moon Bay. Um, and I think what that really does is it does provide affordable housing options and it really has the potential to decrease some of the pressure on some of the other areas that um, might be more contentious for development for a variety of reasons. <coughs> Excuse me. I also respect the, some of the comments that have, have been mentioned about um, short-term rentals, and I'm very mindful of some of the public comment that we heard earlier regarding um, concerns over large hotel proposals in this community, and, um, and there's, there's a connection there between providing some affordable visitor lodging um, in our coastal tourist community, which is an interest of the Coastal Commission, I know, um, and, uh, um, and then, of course, the demand for, for some of the larger hotels. So there's definitely, definitely a connection there. But I, I share the concerns about it. I want to be clear that we're not muddying the water of, right now we're trying to respond to, um, to state guidance and, and to, to update our codes to be in compliance with the state. Um, we have a plan for addressing short-term rentals, um, and I would be very concerned about doing anything that would um, try to couch something under the umbrella of an ADU ordinance that would uh, permit something. I think what has been tried to do here is to try to um, make something that is uh, compatible with our current situation with an eye towards the future to, to, to do something um, and address concerns. Um, through that process, so so I, that's that's where um, generally where you know I stand there. I think we're largely in, in, in accord. Um, does anybody have an opinion on the so two things? One, um, Del Mar. Um, to me, the, so there's four areas where we talked about parking. Del Mar was one that was raised. I, I mean, if city staff wants to back away from that requirement, I, I think that's, I mean, fine. Uh, I don't know if you guys have. It would require a modification to what's attached here. Or we can just leave it as proposed. My only concern would be sort of lumping out a very specific stretch there and equity concerns in the neighborhood. Um, treating one side of the street differently than I guess the other or that sort of thing. Um, but uh, that, would be, that would be the nature of my concerns. And having not heard from many folks from the Del Mar neighborhood and um, you know, Jill, you may have and have a better sense of what the what the issue is there and really what is. Um, so I guess to some degree, yeah, I'm deferring to staff. Couple thoughts on this one. Um, what we proposed was um, both sides of wave and both sides of pillar cedos. So it was, it was consistent um, that uh, both sides of the street were treated the same because the parking would be assumedly on, on those streets, both sides. I, what I'm seeing in um, this was that Casa del Mar, um, even though you have really nice 
short connections to the coastal trail um, between Pillar Cedos and, and the trail. There's a number of little, little routes, especially the one on Wave. You have to go a bit north or a bit south to get to the beach. It's not, um, there, there isn't really a great direct access point there. And that is distinctly different from um, what we see at Miramar and what we see uh, farther south with, with uh, uh, the State Beach and Poplar. So I, and that may be why there's less of that, that parking congestion that um, I just, I haven't seen as much of it there. So it's, you know, really up to you, but I have to say um, we could also, you could add that back in if we're having problems. I don't think you're, th this, is, this is something that um, I think really needs to be said in the room. We are intending to support folks in building these units. I'm not expecting to get hundreds, <laughs> you know, some big. Right. Um, yeah, so um, I'm, I'm, right now, uh, last year we did three. I'm, I'm hoping that's gonna go way up um, many times over that, but I, I can't imagine it being over 20 just, in a year. Just following up on that, the yeah. sort of the coastal access question, I think I know the answer to this, but could you just speak to, I guess, the consistency of some of these areas where you've identified some need for parking for coastal access and our draft coastal access element of the general plan? The key uh, coastal access um, streets that were identified um, in particular between downtown and the beach were Kelly and Poplar, and you can see they're emphasized on this map. And then um, other streets such as uh, Young, uh, Wavecrest, and um, Venice, and, and really any of, any of those streets that are leading to a state Beach parking lot or the city parking lot in Poplar are particularly called out. Um, Miramontes to the south also leads to a public parking lot, so it's another access point. Um, there are no streets in Casa del Mar that were specifically um, designated for coastal access. Casa del Mar does not have any permit parking, um, as far as I know. There is permit parking. Um, we heard about that in, in Miramar as well as on Kelly. And so that is sort of a, a symptom of, of the issue with um, beach parking. You know, uh, since we haven't had a uh, huge flow of permits, and I don't think we're going to have a huge increase just because we passed this, um, are we? kind of putting the cart before the horse or do you think we have to do this because in five years there, there might be an issue? I mean, uh, we're talking about Casa del Mar, Alcest Lorraine and the others. So do we need to include all these at this point? Uh, I'm just trying to ask the question. I, I think so because we've got to comply okay. with state law. So, um, so the, the, the interpretation is it's a visual resource and it's a beach access point. I mean, it's a pretty easy argument to make that, I mean, I've I park in that area all the time when visiting friends, and yeah, maybe there's not a lot of congestion, but it's definitely a beach access area. Um, maybe the locals use it, so I'd be inclined to keep it included for now, just because of the sort of local use pattern. If you're, um, you know, there are a lot of folks using it. I, I, I mean, we, we should include the parking in the other three areas. This one in Casa Del Mar, I'd be, you know, given that it is a beach access street, in my experience, I'd just be inclined to keep it as well. Okay. The only other thing I had was on the, the, the PUDs. Um, it seems like uh, the city's interpret. It's an unusual state of affairs when somebody's asking me to speak up. Um, but yes, I, I'll be happy to do so. Um, the concern I have about the, the PUDs, you know, it is your interpretation, as you said, that, um, that we need to address the PUDs to be in conformance with state law. So I don't think there's a lot of wiggle room there. Brian, I don't know if you have any opinions. I would concur with staff. Okay. Um, 
I don't I don't think I have anything else. You ready to entertain a motion? Uh, oh yeah. wait, we don't are we we're not making a motion this evening or we can? We are. Okay. I'm looking through. So I'll make a motion to adopt the attached resolution recommending approval of the draft ordinance regulating accessory dwelling units to the city council. Do I need to read in this whole one? You don't have to. <laughs> and, that, and that will include, yeah, actually, as, as written. I think we have it. Les, did we miss anything? So. Second? Or yeah, yeah. I didn't hear it in full, but I'll, I'll second whatever you said. So uh, can we get a uh, roll call vote, please, for PDP 18027? Yes. Commissioner Devon? Yes. Vice Chair Holt? Yes. And Chair Hernandez? Yes. Thanks. The motion passes 3 0. This item's closed. Okay. Um, closing in on 9 30 here. Uh, we have. Last item, uh, are there any communications? A couple quick ones. First of all, staff, thanks you. You've met about this four times, and we greatly appreciate your thoughtful work on this. Um, is everybody using able to use your email now? We got you some city emails, and if <laughs> I just want to check in with you on that. So I'm going to need a member of, uh, I mean, I can use it on my computer, but I use my mobile device, and I yeah. can get the mobile email to work on my I've okay. had the same trouble. Yeah, so Are I, you I, too? Okay. Actually, I've had trouble just, yeah, just setting up the Okay. I, I need help. Okay. <laughs> we'll find, are you a helper, Joe? Or Okay. okay. <laughs> so. We'll find a helper. We can maybe okay. have them come to one of the planning commission meetings <laughs> yeah. in advance. That would be yeah. great. Do a workshop. Yes, yeah. we can do that. Okay, great. Right. Thank so, you. So no, uh, it hasn't worked. Agenda forecast, uh, June 26th, we have noticed for 575 Filbert Street, a new single-family home on a substandard lot with a parking exception. Um, I think the agenda, other than that, is light, so it might give us an opportunity to come back and talk about small lot infill after you see that item, because you've now um, been working on these quite a bit, and it's um, pretty informative for us. In July, we would like to um, bring uh, local coastal program chapters to you that have been through the uh, ad hoc committee, and um, we're getting uh, lots of lots of work back through the committee, and we we will be prepared to do that. Uh, lots of community development director items coming up. I, uh, there's an admin approval scheduled for, um, this is all June 27th, um, for a deck proposed at 817 Railroad Avenue. Um, three hearing items, uh, Seacrest School landscaping project, 417 Chesterfield, a new house, and on Metzger, um, a new house for a care home. In July, um, we'll have a hearing uh, for an addition uh, for 393 St. Andrews. It's in the appeals jurisdiction, so we need to have a hearing. And then uh, just a couple quick things that have happened with City Council recently, and uh, John uh, Dowdy alluded to this. Um, the Bike Ped Master Plan and um, Parks Master Plan Award of Contract for CEQA uh, coverage was awarded last week. We're kicking that off and trying to move very quickly. You will see that come back through. Um, your your purview is to review that CEQA document, which um, and and also make any final um, uh, feedback that you have on on those master plans. The parks master plan will come first. We're trying to have it ready for grants that could become available very soon um, relative to. Um, Vice Chair Holt's uh, item of, of the approval of that, that great big um, bond measure. Um, and then we are going to see council on July 17th for, uh, to talk about some uh, downtown opportunities that we've looked at, um, which includes some other kinds of code amendments. So we'll, we'll meet with them first, see what their direction is. Um, so it's a it's a year of policy and coding um, in the background. 
And also, by the way, I forgot, um, June 5th, uh, Council also approved um, a larger scope of work for Huffman Broadway, who is working on the um, ESHA mapping for the local coastal program. Um, the work they've done so far on the mapping uncovered a need to do some more work, and that happens sometimes when, when your map is so out of date. So we were very grateful to Council for continuing to support um, that part of our planning effort. And that's it for me. Thank you. Great. Um, do you have a plan for um, commission meetings that might not be held due to staff vacation schedules or planning commissioner vacation schedules yet? We would be happy to do that with you. If you would like to um, pick a July meeting and an August meeting that you would prefer that, you know, maybe several of you are traveling. Uh, what council has done, um, council will be um, meeting for their second July meeting and their second August meeting and not uh, the first July or August meeting. So that, that's how they're going to reduce their schedule over the summer. I can send you an email tomorrow. I think that would be easiest and then you can chime in if there's a, a date that you just can't make and if we see a cluster of vacations, we'll, we'll plan around that. Okay. It just yeah, sure. So I'll just uh, put mine on July 10th. I am going to be out of country and on vacation okay. in a place that is unlikely to have any type of access. Good um, for you. <laughs> uh, June 26th, I will be traveling, but I would like to attend remotely. Um, okay. I uh, don't know if I'm going to be in Atlanta or Houston, but I will be in one of those two places, and I'll. So you'll coordinate I'll, I'll with Joe, and so we can get the agenda right. Yep. And then. Um, yeah, those are the two that I know about. Okay, thank you. And I've already passed along. I will be out June 26th. Okay, that's right. Um, I understand that uh, Commissioner Benjamin will be back for that meeting. And so I, we'll, we'll double check and, and confirm our quorum, but I, I think we're okay um, if we have you, Commissioner DeMond. And yeah, yes. <laughs> Because while we have uh, last planning commission communications, I'd like to recognize uh, one of our people in the audience, Linda Ponsini, who was on this commission for at least 10 years. Uh, like to see people like that come back. So uh, just good uh, seeing you. Uh, that's all I want to say. Thank you. All right. Any other comments? Okay. Um, can I get a motion? Move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? <laughs> Aye.